Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Rubel. I'm a librarian at George Washington University, right up, uh, right up the road here. Um, I'm in an academic library, and we use APIs in a number of ways as part of developing useful services for our students and our faculty. Um, and I'm going to briefly show you some examples of those services we've developed using APIs and describe some recent experience I've personally had with working with APIs on a research project. Uh, but I'm going to spend most of my time sharing some practical tips about making APIs useful for libraries or your other customers and members, whoever your user community might be. And I think you'll hear me um, validating a lot of what we've actually heard already today on the panel about, about APIs. This is our library's uh, web page, and you can see the search box in the middle of the page. Um, that is a tool that we developed in-house that helps uh, our users discover our full range of resources. So when somebody searches that, they get a uh, result screen that looks like this. It's sort of a bento box style results layout. You may have heard it called that before. We have different boxes of content. Um, because we found our users wanted to see things separated out in this way. So we use um, the, the ProQuest Summon API for a number of these boxes. We're Summon customers and we have our catalog records as well as a large range of article content available through that. And they have an API that lets us uh, highlight articles in one box, books in another box, um, check our research guides. And then we have some local APIs uh, from our local databases of our journal listings and our own database content that we can um, make available to students. We also use the ProQuest 360 link link resolver, which has a very simple API. And that allows our users, when they're in a, on a catalog screen, to get in real time the journal holding dates of coverage available via our link resolver. So those online buttons in the middle have next to them the dates of coverage from each of the um, providers for our resources. And we can keep that up to date using our knowledge base rather than having to maintain that information in uh, the catalog record itself. Another interesting project we're doing uh, uh, leading in the libraries here is helping to capture social media data for researchers on campus. So we actually have software that connects to Twitter's public APIs. And for researchers who don't have funding to buy a Twitter data set, we're collecting that internally to make it available to them to study Twitter. And we're also looking at Flickr and Tumblr and other social media platforms that have APIs and make data available publicly uh, so that we can provide that to students and faculty studying social media. So APIs um, really bring all of this content into new contexts that we can um, develop responding to user needs. And we can bring uh, multiple sources together and look at creating new tools that we hear a, a need for on campus. Um, I personally explored this capability uh, recently as part of a project I work on, worked on during research leave uh, from the libraries at DW. I wanted to learn some new programming languages and some web technologies and uh, demystify APIs a little bit for myself by working with them in a hands-on kind of programming way. So I looked at um, the APIs that are available from the Digital Public Library of America, which you may be familiar with. It aggregates metadata around digitized collections across the, um, the United States. Uh, and then it, it, they provide a great API. And then the Library of Congress uh, also provides APIs for its content. This is the prints and photographs uh, catalog at the Library of Congress. And by connecting to each of these APIs, I was able to uh, build my own web app that could bring together images, for example, of earthquakes from all these different historical collections. So you see on the screen images from the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco that are brought together from DPLA and the Library of Congress into one user interface in a browsing arrangement I thought might be, might be more useful than what those providers um, provided themselves in-house. And then I can also map that data because they made geo-coordinates available via their API as well. And so this is just really uh, maybe a taste of how somebody might access a, re a repository and use that data uh, in their own way. Um, so if you're a publisher or you're a platform provider who's already providing an API, thank you. That's really useful to us. It's a great resource for um, libraries as customers of, and also our community, our end users. Um, so I'd be interested to hear later, if we have some time at the end, about um, 
what maybe you've you've heard or you found as well in talking with your customers about how they've how they've used their APIs to access their content. Whether you provide an API now or you're thinking about doing it, um, I'd like to share some sort of practical tips to think through when you're providing APIs as a service. So. Um, Include the API access in the license for your product, not as an additional license or uh, an additional fee or contract. Um, there's often a very cumbersome process, you know, uh, within libraries or other customers for going through a contract process, and that can really kind of stand in the way of exploring what an API might be able to do. We in libraries often use APIs uh, in developing prototypes and exploring new services. So. Uh, we don't necessarily want to go through a whole big justification process to go through another contract. If it's just available as part of what we already have, that's great. And that's, um, again, part of uh, um, what you know, Elsevier and ISI, we've heard already that they, they do um, the same thing at Thomson Reuters. Where you do provide an API, make it very clear to us what we can do with it. Um, provide examples of acceptable and encouraged uses. As an example, uh, at my library, we're helping lead the campus effort to implement an instance of Vivo, which is an expertise sort of research finder for our campus that has data about our uh, faculty and their research interests. And so we were exploring um, Scopus and the Web of Science APIs to see if they might be useful content for that activity and also for populating a, um, our institutional repository. And, uh, Ala mentioned the Elsevier Developers Portal, and it, right up here, there's a use case that describes uh, that, that what we're looking at doing, uh, encouraging us to do that, and giving actually us some, uh, maybe some guidance and ideas about how to best and most effectively use that in that kind of endeavor. I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't plan that, really. <laughs> um, Open documentation, and this came up earlier in the panel as well. Uh, we, it's, we need to know that one, your API exists, and two, as much as possible in advance about what it does. Uh, that helps us decide whether the project that we're looking at doing is feasible um, and helps us figure out you know, maybe what other potential uses there might be for that API. Include in the documentation what a query would look like, um, what a response would look like, I mean, provide some sample responses or you know, different sort of uh, uh, aspects of your API. Describe the fields that you provide back, not just what they are, but maybe what data type to expect for those and whether it's a mandatory field. Um, if you have rate limits, you know, describe that as well. The more we can know up front, the better about how to do that and don't make it really tough to find that, that documentation. As examples, you might look at DPLA, for example. Also, they have a very... Um, in-depth sort of uh, access point to their uh, API information here with a lot of uh, you know glossary and field references uh, so that's a great tool for someone working uh, working with that API this is similar documentation that the Library of Congress um, puts out for their API and they include lots of examples in it which is very helpful too so in terms of keeping it simple um, uh, Chuck mentioned REST APIs, and I would, you know, I would suggest that you could do a very simple REST API. You don't need to build a, a big framework with a lot of wrappers. Um, SOAP is another um, approach that people have talked about, but REST is a much simpler one that's gaining a lot of popularity and is very accessible. This allows you to just create a URL with a URL, and through even a browser, you can create a query to, a UP, uh, to an API and get a response back. You don't have to do as much um, programming and development around it to really um, get, it, you, get it working. Um, we saw some examples of XML responses back, but just to get a little more technical for a minute, um, more and more APIs are being provided, providing their data using the JSON format, uh, JavaScript object notation format, which is a really lightweight and flexible way to provide your data. It's often faster, and it maps uh, a little more directly to the programming data structures that you know, the developers would be using. And both the Library of Congress and the DPLA API use JSON as an example, so you could look at those and see um, uh, some examples of what that might look like. And then also use very common and simple ways of authentication. So just simply a key. Uh, you know, we saw that, we heard about that in some of the other APIs. You just attach a key that's assigned to you for your use, 
identifying you to the vendor. You don't have to necessarily create a session or do a lot of back and forth each time that you want to connect to the, um, the API. Okay. So facilitating sharing code. If you can showcase your customer's code, if they're willing to do that with you, that's a great resource for your customers and also a, very, a good selling point as well. Um, DPLA, as an example, uh, provides, a, they have a page actually where you can see all sorts of different apps that their customers have come up with. And then you can even link out to, oh, my screenshot's not showing. Uh, you can link out to GitHub where the code is actually hosted and, and see in depth then what that, what that actually looked like. Um, reusable code is really very useful and it helps create a community around your, your API and helps other developers working in similar areas connect up with each other. These are wrappers in different languages that, DP, that DPLA um, users have created around the DPLA API. So if somebody's working in Python or Java or um, R even, they have a good starting point here. Uh, somebody else can find this code and use it in, in their application. Use the API yourself. Uh, there are a number, I mean, rather than build something extra that you're going to have to remember to maintain and keep in sync with your other services, if you're relying on it, then you have a sort of a vested interest to make sure it has all of the new features and it's reliable and working, working well. And then finally, um, be available. So make it clear how someone might get in contact with someone who can answer questions about the API. Um, regular customer service is probably not the right point of service for a developer who's running into problems using your API. Let people file tickets, um, get in touch with your technical staff directly, and also get in touch with each other so that you can really build that community around, around the API. Your customers may be able to help each other answer each, each other's questions as well. So um, in conclusion, APIs are a great way, as I was saying, to connect with your user community. Um, and it really allows you to engage with libraries and other customers at a deeper level. It can really help you anticipate what people are wanting in the future from your product uh, and help you get a sense to sort of testing what might be a way that, what might be an area you want to invest your own resources in developing. Um, I just have one um, footnote at the end about something that just came up uh, yesterday, or the, there's the news article recently about this. You may have heard that um, uh, Oracle had filed a suit against Google uh, about copyright infringement of Google's use of the Oracle Java APIs, mm. um, claiming that APIs were copyrightable. And uh, this had been uh, in, in under appeal, and the Department of Justice recently advised the Supreme Court uh, to consider to not hear the not hear the appeal to the case um, Oracle had won, and that uh, to really continue to have APIs viewed uh, the copyright um, excuse me have APIs considered reuse of them under under fair use and have them be considered copyrightable, which I think really goes against the uh, bear the sharing and sort of what Gordon was talking about the real intent of APIs is to share code and reuse code. If there's a copyright liability for somebody else to use it, that really is just completely against the grain of that. So it's really it's worth I think probably paying attention to whether the Supreme Court takes that, um, decides to hear that case or not, because that really could have an impact on the kinds of software development we were, we've just been talking about for the past hour and a half. Thank you.
agency system should work. This is how online publishing platforms should work. And start adopting it. Let the community kind of have some guidance. That would be my recommendation. That's absolutely surely not uh, Adipon's policy. It's a, it's a personal view of the future, of a better way of going about it. Uh, but that's a good question. Any comments from the board? Agreed. Other questions? So I'm, I'm interested in your experience, uh, particularly in supplying on the, on the API side, in terms of tuning the things for performance. Mm -hmm. So there was a comment, I think, uh, when you said you did it as a marketing exercise, mm -hmm. and presumably hilarity it's used, <laughs> it, uh, once it actually started getting used. Right. So what happened next? It's happening right now. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we, we roll out things, products, and services like this uh, as softly as we can to see what kind of reaction we're going to get. Um, we haven't seen enough people using it to the degree that we thought to say, did we roll it out properly? What has to change? Um, part of publisher relations is being in constant contact with what are you doing, how are you using it, and how can we serve you better? Um, hilarity would be preferred at this point, I think. <laughs> right now it's a little bit of chaos, but, um, but it gets better every day. <laughs> Uh, for us, not yet. We have. We, we use a uh, technology provider called Layer 7, which um, they take a slightly different approach maybe, or it's, it's a while back since we made that vendor selection uh, than, for instance, in Mashery. Um, and it's, they, what I sh the slide that I showed earlier where we have this unified API layer on top of our web services, basically they provided us with the boxes and the uh, software to configure that. It's really just in a way, they assume that you have your own web services. So you can wrap them into their software, you can define policy languages and so on, do the throttling and all those types of things. But we do have them in-house in our own data center. Um, there is going to, they are going to be moving to the cloud at some point. There's customization that we've done uh, in order to fit, uh, to have to fit our needs better. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we certainly didn't, did not want to reinvent the wheel in that sense. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, panel. Very much is very important.